Thank you so much for coming. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, I was going to talk um, a bit about... Um, it's my title. I'm not sure my talk quite addresses the title. But anyway, I was going to talk a little bit about how, uh, how we deal with the impact question on mega journals. Because, of course, you know, as everyone knows, I don't really need to go into this in great detail, but the current system where you publish... Your, uh, you do your research, you publish your paper in science, and then you get funding, and it goes round and round like that, is, uh, is of course, perfect uh, for everyone who gets everything published in science. For most of us, it's more like this, where you, get, uh, you send it to science, and they say, no, certainly not, too boring. Uh, it goes round and round this cycle several times, and ends up in your niche journal of choice. And, uh, you know, by which time, sort of 18 months has passed, and uh, everyone has moved on. So, um, and then you might get funding uh, if you're lucky. So, so clearly, you know, the system is, uh, um, is, is heavily uh, set up kind of against scientists. And really the reason that a lot of this bit happens is because of the question of impact. That essentially we're getting uh, reviewers to make a decision on whether this paper is important enough for this particular journal. Um, and that's an incredibly inefficient way of working. Um, this slide, I'm sure everyone's seen this, you know, that essentially, you know, peer review has become this incredibly painful process where we would prefer a walk of shame <laughs> to actually having to do it. Um, so, so the idea behind PLOS One um, is that there is a different way of doing it. And essentially, you, uh, you, have, a, um, uh, you have your submission cycle, and of course, you still have peer review, and you still reject papers that uh, don't meet your standards. But um, if the paper is found to be scientifically valid, then we will publish it and that we do the impact assessment after publication. Uh, as I said, this is nothing new um, anymore. And uh, PLOS One uh, was the first to do it, but we're certainly not the last. So here we go, these are our criteria. We essentially, we, you know, we ask the questions about whether the paper is um, rigorous, whether it's ethical, um, and, and so on. But we don't ask whether it's important and whether it's you know, for the right audience and so on. And we decided that, 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 that those kinds of questions work better to be asked um, after publication. And so, again, PLOS One uh, has been extremely successful. We've had huge numbers of uh, new mega journals entering the field uh, over the past uh, three or four years. Uh, let's see how long this goes on. Apologies if I've forgotten anyone. Uh, these are the more recent ones, Royal Society of Open Science, uh, Science Advances, and then most recently, uh, Helion from Elsevier earlier this year. So it's a pretty good list. It's, uh, mega journals are very much a part of the um, establishment now, and I think um, they, uh, the, the success, I think, doesn't really need to be, to be talked about anymore. Um, the idea behind PLOS One, this is how Varmus, one of our founders, said when we first launched the journal uh, 10 years ago, um, that essentially that what we would end up with is a large compendium of papers that have been vetted for scientific quality but which will not be confined in terms of their likely importance. Um, and that's what we have. But of course that doesn't mean that we don't care about impact or that we don't... Or, I think there is often a misperception that, that people think that um, mega journals view all papers to be exactly the same quality, impact, you know, however, whatever word you use. And of course that's not the case. Everyone knows that some papers are more important than others or a bigger deal than others. But how do you find those papers in a, a world where you, you publish first and ask that question later? Um, we developed a suite of article level metrics. Um, uh, Kevin talks a bit about these this morning, but uh, I was going to go into a bit more detail. Essentially they're broken up into various different um, um, different kind of categories, ways of, of looking at the, the impact of a paper. Uh, and this is some data from Martin Fenner from um, uh, a year or two ago. It basically shows all the different ways in which, um, uh, in which papers are received by the readers. So obviously there's, uh, there's page views, there's uh, PDFs, uh, and then things like Mendeley um, uh, is the yellow one, Facebook likes, Crossref, Plus notes and comments, research blogging. We don't use that anymore. So, so you know, you can see it's a, a huge, a huge kind of variation in the way in which people um, interact with the literature. Sorry, did you say you don't use it anymore? Uh, we don't. We don't use research blogging. We have other other sort of blog networks, but um, but we're not using that one. I'm sure it's still going actually. Um, this is a live link, but actually, I'm not going to risk it. I'll just I'll share the slide. Um, Essentially, this is, this is a, a paper on PLOS One. You can see that we have the summary metrics at the top, um, uh, and then this is a metrics tab that actually shows a bit more detail of them. Uh, and if you scroll down that, you can see, just see at the bottom there, the, um, the kind of cumulative views. You then also have uh, citations, various different, various different places, uh, Mendeley. Um, Wikipedia, this one's really interesting. So Wikipedia is the, um, the fifth 
highest referrer of, D of DOIs. So uh, it's kind of incredible. It's becoming more and more important as a sort of means of citation, a means of kind of showing um, uh, the, the sort of impacts of research. Uh, so this paper has three Wikipedia citations. Uh, I, I think this is going to be extremely important, and I think it sort of shows a breadth of, of, uh, of uh, dissemination that we haven't seen before. Twitter and Facebook, um, and chatbacks again, we don't really use. This slide is a little old. Um, this one we added about a year ago. This is media coverage. Um, so essentially, uh, in related content, we actually track all the media coverage around a paper. Uh, Plus One has always had very uh, successful um, media um, coverage, we, we get uh, a great amount of attention. I think it's really, I think that has really can't be underestimated as sort of a reason of, uh, that we're successful. If, you see, if we're seen a lot in the newspapers, then people, you know, it's just re, re, you know, reinforcing the brand. So, uh, so this paper got huge amounts of coverage. Uh, and as a result, you know, was was pretty high, highly viewed. Um, was uh, was quite an interesting paper. But uh, and you know, and this this happened very quickly. The you know those. Um, so yes, it was published on the seventh. You know, as with 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 most papers, the the news coverage came out the same day, and um, and you know, and then the, so these things accumulated very quickly. So there was there wasn't much delay to show that this paper is clearly you know of interest to to a certain group of people. <laughs> Uh, but that group of people is very diverse. This is really interesting. So basically, this shows that um, the, of again, yeah, it's a couple of years old. The um, uh, of of the papers that were looked at, there were a subset that had you know reasonably well cited. There were a subset that were reasonably well viewed. But there were but the two weren't mutually exclusive. You know, there are some that show both, but there are a lot that are one or the other. You know, not hugely highly viewed, but highly cited, and vice versa. So essentially. It's, it's a kind of it's a complicated um, uh, a complicated structure in which the um, these things are are um, interacted with by the by the readers uh, and we divide them up into scholarly usage we have uh, which you know includes citations PDF you know people generally uh, a lay reader won't be downloading the PDF um, the uh, you know views in uh, again views in PubMed Central no one really uses that except academics and mainly through um, uh, PubMed. Uh, and the reviews and comments. Whereas, you know, the broader impact, things like uh, people reading uh, the HTML on the website, uh, the tweets and Facebook likes, the blogs and media coverage. It's a sort of a different use case. Um, the, uh, and the Reddit effect I just thought I'd mention because it is really interesting. Reddit, I'm sure, I don't know if many people use here. It's, uh, you know, they advertise themselves as the front page of the internet. And to be honest, that's pretty accurate. If we get a page, if we get a paper coming on the front page of Reddit, um, it basically crashes our servers. You know, this was this essentially a day after a paper appeared on Reddit. It, um, you know, the views just went through the roof. It's an incredibly powerful um, driver of content. What's interesting about it is that these are, uh, you know, it's had huge numbers of comments, um, and they're very varied. You know, this person, I'll let you read it. It's kind of it's quite a funny comment. It's basically someone saying that they picked out something in the methods and said, you know, this, there is one participant who has to be excluded because they they realised what the trick was, and, you know, like a boss. And clearly, this isn't a scientist writing this. This is just someone who is, who's read, you know, a person, a member of the public who read this paper, thought this was a kind of kooky finding, and, and, and posted it on Reddit. So this is an entire different usership than than anything the academic literature is is used to. Um, and I think you know goes to show I'd sort of. You know, contrary to, to what David was saying, I would say that it does show that access to the full literature does lead to all kinds of interesting things and, uh, and you know, far beyond uh, anything that we can, we can um, think of in advance. Um, so we've been doing some work recently um, on whether it's possible... The, so the problem we have is that uh, ALMs, of course, are very good at showing how a paper is being received after it's published, but it takes time. Um, and especially citations, you know, it takes a really long time to see whether a paper is a, is a really big discovery or not. Um, and that's a kind of problem. You know, if, we, if the idea is that we get rid of all these, these small journals, we have them in one place, then it, you end up with just, if you do your PubMed search, you end up with a whole load of papers that all have the same plus one citation. Um, and, you know, that's not very good. For example, plus one, maybe it would be something else. But uh, um, the, that's clearly not very useful. You know, you, you do want to get some idea when you look at your, uh, your paper of whether it is potentially a you know a big deal um and can is there any way that we can we can predict that so what we've been doing for a couple of years is asking reviewers 
right at the bottom. So we have a review form, like lots of journals. We ask reviewers particular questions when they're, when they're assessing the paper. This is all pre-publication. Uh, when they're assessing the paper, we ask them various questions. And then right at the end, there's this question that says, if accepted, do you think this submission should be highlighted on the PLOS One website? We don't evaluate uh, perceived on per uh, significance or readership, but the aim is to provide tools to filter and evaluate our publications. So we've been asking this question since 2013, but in fact we've never actually used, we've never actually used the output from it for various boring reasons. We, uh, we've never actually done anything with it. So what we've done is we've collected this huge data set of recommendations from reviewers about whether a paper is uh, potentially impactful. Um, but then because we haven't actually highlighted those papers, it's a completely kind of clean data set. And it's, it's you know, extremely useful uh, to go back now and actually see what, uh, what the kind of impact was. Um, so what we did, we um, extracted all the reviews from manuscripts accepted in 2015. That's the end of, end of 25,000 um, manuscripts. The actual number of reviews is about 55,000, I think. Um, and essentially anyone who answered yes to that question, we put into the the potentially impactful group. And everyone that... Uh, so, so essentially, if there were three reviews on a paper, if just one of those reviewers said, yes, I think this should be highlighted, then we put it into, that ca into the highlighted category and the other... And we compared it to ones where everyone had said no or didn't answer. Uh, and then we looked at HTML views and citations. So essentially, um, the, uh, this, I, I did this yesterday, and um, I'm not a statistician, so I'm gonna be, I want you to say this with a huge pinch of salt, please, because it's really, you know, it needs a lot more analysis. But what I, sh what I found, which is quite exciting, now. Yeah, <laughs> is that actually there is a, a significant difference. So essentially, if, you, if a reviewer says, yes, I think this paper should be highlighted, so essentially it uh, kind of indicates that, yes, I think it's potentially impactful, it's worth people knowing about, and you should highlight it on your website. So for the papers where they did say that, those papers do have higher views and higher citations. In fact, look, look, the error bar here is so small that you actually, it's actually invisible. Uh, but there are tiny, tiny error bars here, so you know, this does look significant. As I said, I'm not a statistician, um, and it's not normally distributed, so I do need to do a bit of tweaking. But, uh, but certainly there is an interesting effect here. So this is about 35%, this is about 20%. So, so yeah, so... And, as far as I know, this is, no one else has done anything like this. So I think this is a kind of really interesting result. That if a reviewer does say, yes, I think this paper is going to be impactful, those papers do, lead to, uh, do have higher usage after the fact. But take it with a big pinch of salt and wait until it's probably, <laughs> probably been analysed. But anyway, I just want to share it because I thought it was quite cool. Uh, if I, I think I'm done, actually. That's, uh, yeah, so essentially, yeah, Mega Journals... Um, I, I don't think I need to, to go into um, the, the reasons that you know, mega journals have, uh, have changed the way that we, that we um, assess impact. But it has um, led to a lot of interesting, um, uh, interesting learning about the way papers are, are viewed by the public. And the peer reviewers do seem to be able to pick papers that are potentially going to be impactful. Again, we need to look into it more, but it's interesting. So I'll leave it there.